Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's bounty episode of the Day Zero Podcast. I'm Spectre. With me is Z. Today we have a PHP bug, um, some research on server-side prototype pollution, and some other miscellaneous bugs mixed in there. And we'll start off with the PHP bug. So, Z, I'll let you jump into this one. Yeah, this one's a pretty fun issue. Uh, one of the key things with this is I'm not too sure about the exploitability of it. Did you get a CVE? There's it's definitely not doing things correctly. I'll, I'll say that much, but um, basically it's an issue with password verify. So has kind of some security implications, uh, specifically if you give it a malformed hash. So with password verify, you generally give it both the password that like a user provider plus the hash, and it'll kind of securely do the verification. It has some things that it does there, but um, the problem here, so being if you give it a malformed hash to compare with, uh, specifically a, I don't think they lay out all of the conditions, but at least when I took a look at the actual patch for uh, this bug, um, it basically required that the salt section of the uh, hash, so you'll see down here, the hash is kind of separated by the dollar signs, uh, kind of delineating these different parts of the hash, like the first part will indicate the type of hash. Uh, pretty standard format on that front. Um, but if you include a dollar sign inside of the salt segment, um, when it's reading like the bcrypt salt, um, it'll see that breaks a loop out way too early, and ultimately password verify ends up returning true, even though they don't actually match. But that only happens if you're able to provide it this malformed hash to compare with, which is a big ask in my opinion. Um, I can't think of a lot of scenarios where somebody would uh really be left with that level of control like i don't know if, if you can think of like a normal application that would actually give an attacker control over that hash but it does feel like the sort of trick that might be you know worth being aware of um i could imagine a sort of scenario maybe you're in a restrictive sql injection scenario in like a login box or something um you're in there, you're able to pull back some data, so you're maybe able to inject this custom hash that's going to compare with, and you can't just replace it with something you straight straight out know because it's in like a user-based salt in there, some, I don't know, doing some weird things. I don't know. I can imagine this contrived scenario for use of it. Um, it is a really interesting bug because it is with password verify, but I can't immediately think of how you would actually be able to exploit this one. Um... It's just one of those bugs that, like, it's really weird to see it. Um, and actually, since I was talking about the code, I should pull that up here. Um, yeah, and while you do that, I'll say, like, the the way that I would jump to thinking about exploiting this would be, you know, if you had an SQL injection scenario or something like that. But if you had that scenario, you could just change the hash entirely, so you don't really need to, like, pull off this where, kind of trick. That's so. where I'm thinking, if you had some extra limitation that was being done with that SQL injection limiting you so you either you couldn't disclose what the proper hash should be because there's always like a per user salt um so you can't like recreate a hash and just replace it something like that i i can imagine some sort of scenario for that but it is contrived i in a lot of cases you should be able to approach it some other way besides uh trying to abuse this bug um but yeah the code here it's just you've got this macro for the bf safe a2i so string to integer um and it just has this weird little php hack comment um where if it ends up seeing the character at source um if that ends up being the dollar sign just break so one that is a weird really weird thing to see when it like you see a macro here so this is php but it's a c implementation um you see a macro that has a break that's kind of a red flag just in general because you have to be careful about like every user of that macro has to be aware that's going to break not just doing something like a uh, return and especially in this case where it is returns but there's this one edge case specifically labeled php hack that does a break um the actual usage of this uh is just down here or I thought it was just a little bit lower, but I'm not seeing it right now. Might be, 
might be a bit off. Either way, it's just being used in a loop. Um, in I believe it was BFD code, which I'm. I think it's getting collapsed on you by Git. I think that's why oh, you can't it find it. Oh yeah, right there. Yeah, I was looking at the end. Um, I knew it was right around there. Yeah, BFD code. Um, it just has this do while loop where it's using the macro. Um, so when it unexpectedly hits that, ends up hitting the PHP hack break. Um, and then later on, it does some string recovery, moving the pointers around again as part of that PHP hack. So this was just part, uh, like basically a place where um, Bcrep based around Blowfish, um, the Blowfish implementation in PHP from the beginning has had this little hack in it. Nobody really documented why it had that hack, so they just removed it. Uh, but because of that difference, creating this sort of issue. Yeah, really fun bug. Like, it's really interesting to see it there. Not too sure about exploitability, but still, it is kind of a cool little bug. So I want to bring it up here. Yeah, as a side tangent, I wonder if there were other functionality that would rely on that implementation would be vulnerable to the same type of issue. Um, password verify is, you know, kind of an easy one to jump to because it is like the recommended function for doing off the, like authentication. It's a pretty sensitive action. Um, there might be some other stuff, though, that relies on, you know, the, the blowfish that could be vulnerable in this way that's more useful in a lot of scenarios. Um, yeah, that's, I'm not exactly yeah. sure how like the complete chain for this bug works. I saw this crypt patch, um, but where it goes from there, because obviously this is getting called kind of deep and password verified just kind of defers into crypt to actually implement all of the crypto, it just, you know, does algorithm discovery and then off it goes into the crypt library. So I don't know exactly how it goes from that to actually getting past all the way up to password verify and breaking it. I wish I had a better understanding of that. I tried digging through the code, but I honestly just didn't get it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't know where else like that bug could come, but at the same time, yeah, when you have these sort of differences between crypto implementations, there is always room for some sort of bug to come out of it, especially when somebody is using crypt. Uh, part of this does seem to rely on the fact that crypt has a really w weird edge case or not edge case, air case. Uh, the crypt functions will return. I believe what they guarantee is on an error to return a string that is guaranteed to be different from the salt in like 13 characters or something. Like it has a really weird return. Um, uh, I'm not sure if I can find exactly where that's documented right now, but it has this really weird return. So it, does, it feels a little bit like just a poor API implementation too that's getting used kind of underlying all of this. Yeah. Uh, now on the report level, there was also a bit of interesting discussion back and forth because uh, the first, like there was one maintainer that left the first post on it saying uh, they don't believe that this is a security bug, um, basically saying that, you know, password verify says that the hash should come from password hash. Uh, and yeah, it, it was a bit weird because um, they say that like it's it's supposed to be known that it would fail. Um, but then, you know, the original reporter linked the documentation for that page and it... it <laughs> didn't say anything about that. Um, so another maintainer came in and then said, like, yeah, it should be considered a bug um, because, you know, it says that when a password, uh, yeah, when passed the correct password and the generated hash, uh, it should return true. If there is any failure, such as the hash being invalid, it should return a Boolean false. So, yeah, it kind of violates what they said there. So they did come around to it being a bug, but, uh, you know, <laughs> It's funny to see, though, just because PHP does kind of have a reputation with the maintainers wanting to brush off vulnerabilities. Um, you know, I'm, I'm aware that this one would be probably a low impact one and not really useful in many cases, but still, um, you know, they, they came around on it, but it was just kind of funny reading through the, uh, the report for this one. Yeah, and I get, like, the idea is, like, garbage in, garbage out. That's where... Uh, the original maintainer kind of came in on that. Feed it garbage, you're going to get garbage out. Fair game. I kind of, at, at one point, I would have somewhat agreed with that. Password verify, though, is, like, it has security implica implications. Um, beyond that, it feels to me like that's just saying, like, this is bad like, it's just a bad API design if you're not going to kind of handle the garbage consistently. 
I guess would be the other thing. Um, and we talked about that. I think it was with like, uh, um, this is quite a while back. We covered a library that was just really easy to use insecurely. I want to say it was open SSL, but I don't remember. It might've been like a PGP or G GPG library or something. Um, I don't remember which was, it was some crypto library, but you know, had all of this functionality and it was just super easy to use it insecurely. Um, and kind of relying on the cop-out case of, well, it's documented, feels like it's just a cop-out and really shouldn't be the case for anything that's widely used. Yeah, it doesn't mean you shouldn't design your API to be resilient at all. It's, it's yeah, I agree. Cop-out is a good word for it. Uh, and IPR mentions, I can actually think of one CTF challenge that already abuses a weird edge case and password verifies bcrypt implementation. Yeah, um, I'm not surprised. Like, especially PHP is a fun target for a lot of uh, those kinds of CTF challenges, just because there's so many weird things with like uh, under the hood stuff because of like code debt and whatever. I don't know. It's weird. But yeah, yeah we'll, I mean, uh, we'll move into our next topic. Oh, do you have something to say? I was there? just going to say, like, one of my first. Uh, I'd say not my first challenge ever, but one of my first like real CTF challenges that I was actually kind of proud of was like a weird PHP edge case. Yeah. So we'll move into our next topic here, which is a post by uh, Rodux from Trial of, uh, Trail of Bits on a logic bug in the readline library, uh, which is used by various things, including CHFN, which is the change finger utility for changing username and other information. And what they ended up noticing after digging into readline a little bit was that readline would utilize this environment variable called input RC, uh, which it allowed for passing a, a, an initial configuration file. And, you know, as you would expect, it's parsed line by line. And if it encountered any errors, like, say, encountering errors that begin with a quote but don't end in a quote, things like that, um, it would basically dump the, the contents of the line into, like, the error logging. Um, some of the other cases that would, like, trigger this behavior is Lines that start with a colon but don't have any white spaces or nulls, or lines that don't contain spaces, tabs, or colons, which that one's like the critical one because it fits the bill for things like SSH keys or like anything that's in a PEM container. So yeah, by just passing in a file that has lines that, you know, it, it won't like when it's trying to parse that configuration, you can end up like exfiltrating the file contents. Um, yeah, so I don't via think that. it's necessarily the case that it's erring because the line doesn't have any colon spaces or whatever. Um, the notes when it actually shows the output here from a Etsy shadow example, um, yeah. the error itself is unknown key modifier. So it, it parses a line fine. That's like, it's parsing this as a config. It doesn't know what this config entry is. And then, uh, reflecting that out. So anything that kind of fits is this key, which includes, so any, any line that isn't separated by like the colon space or whatever, yeah. um, gets printed, but not exactly the line itself being the problem. It's. It not matching. Sorry, slightly nuanced thing there, but no worries. Yeah, it's just that it's not able to uh, to perform the lookup or anything like that. So yeah, um, you're able to exfiltrate file contents um, through that. It's a pretty easy bug because of like change finger being a set UID binary. Um, you can also use it to exfiltrate sensitive file contents. Their POC here uses Etsy Shadow, for example, um, but you could use it on other other things too, like you know, SSH keys or any other PEM data that's supposed to be privileged off from you. So, yeah, I mean, it's a pretty high impact bug and it's pretty easy to understand. It's basically just um, overly verbose error logging that you can abuse to to leak data. So um, it's kind of a fun, fun post, but not too complex of a bug. Yeah, no, uh, so I'm not sure I agree with you on it being a case of overly verbose error logging. Like, I, I know that's where this issue is being introduced from, but if it were dealing with a configuration file, would printing out and it comes across an invalid key, like that feels like an okay thing to print the key to the file, it's just the fact that the attacker can actually create a problem here. But like, I don't feel like that's too verbose of an error message to say like, hey, this line you provided is uh, wrong. Oh, okay, like but I then how do you deal with it? Because, like, I think the idea is that you're supposed to be able to pass, like, an untrusted file there, like... I don't know like, if you're yeah. supposed to be able to pass an untrusted file as the config. It's not stripped, so it's trusting something that I probably shouldn't trust. Um, 
I mean, ultimately, they just, uh, the patch here was just not using read line in, like, uh, sewage binaries. But I, yeah. I agree with you. Like, I don't, like, I don't know what the fix would be here. I mean, sewage binaries are kind of the special case for this, because if it were just a user, their own files, that's all they can access. There's no privilege escalation uh, aspect, yeah. It, so, like, I agree there's an issue here. Like, I'm definitely not saying, oh, there's no issue, like, whatever. But at the same time, if a program were to fail on me while reading a configuration file and not give me any indication about what went wrong, that would be, you know, I would consider that kind of, not a security issue, but, like, I, I feel like this is a fair error to go or, like, to print. It makes sense to print it. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure if we want to um, go too far into this discussion because ultimately it's an issue. I'm just kind of arguing on a slight nuance over whether or not it's uh, verbose error messages. I mean, kind of what I was thinking was you could pass like which line has the problem without disclosing the full line. That said, like, you know, that's just how you choose to do your error handling. But what I was getting at there was that it's not a straightforward fix. Uh, it's a bit of it's taking advantage of um, more of like a design type problem uh, compared to like just a logic bug. Right. So, yeah, it's, it's an interesting case. I don't know exactly what the best way to fix this would be, um, whether it would be limiting that input config configuration file to certain files or um you know stripping the verbosity away from the error logging i don't know um you could go about it a few different ways but like you said the way they patched it here was just by <laughs> not using read line so fair enough yeah and iabr um, mentions you know quick everyone go use this uh to go get the roof flags and all the boxes you haven't popped yet um fortunately this was patched a pretty good amount of time ago uh looks like they reported this um, it was in 2022, ago, yeah. yeah, February of 20 of 22 was fixed in February of 22, and just not disclosed until uh, 2023. Yeah, and the other thing that they mentioned there that I don't think we called out yet was um, CHFN also isn't like provided by Util Linux typically, so it's also not something that you're going to have access to mostly. Like, it's probably not going to be installed on the machine anyway. So. There, there's some limiting factors there as well, but uh, yeah, still a fun bug nonetheless. Yeah, and still, it's an interesting thing to be aware of in case, you know, you do come across a random, like, custom secured binary that is using read line. That isn't necessarily that uh, unheard of, so definitely a chance for you to still exploit this, because I believe it was just patched, as I said, by not using it in secured binary, so just another thing to look for. Yeah. So up next, we have an Azure Active Directory uh, B2C crypto bug that can lead to account takeover. And although they call it a crypto bug here, it's more of a misuse rather than like a super low level, like implementation level issue. Um, and it has to do with how refresh tokens are created um, as they're generated and recommended to be encrypted with RSA. I'm doing air quotes on encrypted, even though nobody can see it. Um, and yeah, the problem is here. Is just the fact that the encryption uses the RSA public key, which of course is public. So if an attacker can recover the public key, which they say is like pretty doable because it's shared with various things, um, you can basically, as an attacker, generate and encrypt your own refresh token and subvert the OAuth flow. So again, one of those instances where crypto is misapplied, thinking that crypto will you know keep you safe, keep your data and like the integrity of your data without thinking of the nuances. Um, we've seen this kind of issue before. I was a little bit surprised to see it in Azure like this. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a bit of a weird bug. Um, one of those things where you could maybe skip over it if you're not thinking too much about, you know, the nuances of RSA and what the implications are of using the public key like that. Yeah, but it does. Um, it does rely on kind of recognizing it's doing that because, um, you're just specifying, uh, like their default kind of instructions or their tutorial for generating these keys is to you know create your signing key so create your rsa key usage signature and then key usage encryption um and then other code here that's actually doing the uh um encryption of like the token 
it's unaware of, or it's probably not even thinking about like, oh, this is an RSA key, so I actually need to sign, not encrypt. Um, it's just like, well, this is how you encrypt it with this key. Not realizing or not looking into the fact or handling the edge case that RSA and public key crypto, you know, it's kind of backwards in a lot of ways. The key is used to, like, other people use the public key to encrypt to that key rather than just using the secret key itself. Um, so it seems like that's kind of what happened here is Microsoft broke their code being very agnostic about what the actual key or encryption was. They just like you kind of specify anything and their tutorial just happens to default or teach people to use this more insecure option, but it does depend on places kind of doing this. I, I'm assuming there are other, there's support for other key types because you do have to specify the key type of RSA. Um, so somewhere could, you know, do this securely and not realize it, but it is one of those things that would be pretty easy to overlook. I think if you're just reading the code because, oh, it's encrypting with the key, like, it's fine. Um, it's just the configuration itself kind of creates the issue here. Yeah, and jumping down a little bit, uh, they do have this interesting section I wanted to call out on uh, our MSRC Business Impact. And they were saying, like, um, this type of vulnerability could potentially be used to view, like, vulnerability reports that researchers have submitted before they're fixed. Um, so, you know, getting free zero days. Um, so, yeah, like, the information disclosure potential here is pretty high. Like, you could end up disclosing some, some pretty important things, um, which actually is another thing. So towards the top, they uh, Microsoft calls this out as like a information disclosure issue, um, which is a little bit confusing at first because it it kind of almost downplays the issue a little bit, in my opinion, um, because basically what they're saying there is that the I believe is that the information disclosure happens because you can take over an account that has access to, you know, things like the vulnerability reports. Um, but, you know, of course, an account hijack, you're able to do more than just view sensitive information. So. Yeah, um, I figured I'd call that out quickly, but yeah, that section was kind of interesting. We do like to talk about those scenarios where vulnerability reports can get leaked because um, it's, you know, it's very meta. It's it's fun to think about, but um, yeah, yeah, ultimately this, it comes down to like misusing crypto here. Yeah, and this could impact others besides MSRC. MSRC just happens to also be using this Azure service. Um, yeah. The information disclosure, disclosure aspect Stood out to me in large part because I kind of read that. Um, so I I skipped down initially to details, read what the issue was, and then kind of went back up and looked at some other stuff. And I'm like, how is this info disclosure? This is like this isn't the sort of vulnerability I would usually call an information disclosure. Um, you might be right about why they're calling it as like the specific use case of against MSRC is resulting in info disclosure. But it's also resulting in like an account hijack almost. Um, it is worth noting, I don't think we mentioned here, but uh I believe there was also yeah, the tenant ID, uh, there were some things that weren't easily guessable, but they were able to potentially disclose them because you did need the uh, tenant ID um an audience in like the token created. Uh so there is a little bit more work, and they don't really talk about um how they disclose the public key, so that itself is also an issue. Um, because, yeah, it's a public key, but given the use case, you're, it's not necessarily the public key that you're sharing a lot. Um, if it is used elsewhere, like I said, they obviously found a way to leak for MSRC, but there is kind of an issue that they're not talking about here, which is how they're actually disclosing the RSA public key that's getting used. Yeah, and they also mentioned that you would have to do some, like, figuring out of the format and everything, too, that, which they kind of leave as, like, a, you know, exercise to the reader or whatever. Um, they don't really cover it in the blog post, but, yeah, there are some some other mitigating circumstances um, that you would have to, to figure out to really abuse this attack, assuming, you know, it wasn't patched, which it is, so, but, yeah, it's, it's fair to call it out. All right, so uh, up next we have a bug in uh, Haproxy. Hypro I always mess that up when we have to talk about it. Uh, Haproxy's HTTP header parsing, um, which can yield a sort of request smuggling type issue. Um, and ultimately, what it comes down to is just accepting empty header field names. Um, so for a bit of background, 
they talk about H pack, um, which is you know used for decompressing, um, and the fact that H pack would use empty header names to terminate a list of headers, as empty header names were forbidden by the protocol. Um, and as such, this idea of terminating the list of headers with a null field name was carried into further protocols such as QPack. Um, and so if you can just get an empty header field name parsed um, as an attacker, you can terminate that list of headers early and potentially get some headers dropped, um, which can allow you to potentially do like a desync and pull off a smuggling attack, at least on HTTP 1, um, because you could end up dropping some important headers from making its way to the upper layers, such as like host uh content length headers transfer encoding or other sensitive headers um and yeah as as it turns out it's possible to get these empty field names decompressed in both uh hpack and qpack so it's a pretty significant vulnerability in http1 http2 and 3 are somewhat mitigated due to them not using things like content length and tra transfer encoding because of the headers like how they work being different not relying on um such like a hacky system it's it's mitigated a bit they're it basically, it's just treated as if the headers weren't sent by the client. Um, so it's not as much of a, it's not as serious of a scenario. But yeah, um, ultimately what this can lead to is request smuggling, which as we've seen in the past many times, can be leveraged pretty effectively. Um, the commit message goes into a bit more detail on what you could potentially do, uh, as well as some of the fixes. Um, mainly there, they just try to prevent empty headers from being inserted or, or decoded at all, um, as you would expect. But yeah, there's a little bit more information in this uh, commit. You might have to do some like you know background research because it 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 it's a commit message, so it's assuming you have a lot of the background already. It's not really intended for general consumption, but, but it yeah. is a very good. It it ha it's a very it's good a very commit detailed message. message. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean. I don't know if I'd expect like every commit ever to be like this. To be like, oh, it's a good commit message. Here's an example of one. Maybe not, but like they include a lot of information in here. Like this commit message is very much the bug report and everything you kind of need to know about the core bug. You might need to do some background if you're unfamiliar with some of the specifics of HTTP one, two, three, or whatever. Uh, but yeah, really good message. All right. So for our last topic, we have a post by Portswigger on server side prototype pollution. Uh, I'll let Z give the uh, give the lowdown on this one, and then we'll move into our shoutouts and wrap up. Yeah, and this is um, kind of also going to be a shout out. It's talking about um, well testing for server side prototype pollution and the danger with testing in general for prototype pollution. Um, so normally, you know, when it's happening on the client side and you're going for like XSS or something, refresh the page and any prototype that was polluted is done. Like it won't be polluted any longer. On the server side and in a server side application, that is less the case. If you do the pollution, it can last until the server restarts, which can take a while. It's going to have a lasting impact. So kind of talks about the denial of service problem, not wanting to break things. And then goes into several methods, uh, some of which are just like ways of causing a denial of service as quick ways to actually test it's there. Of course, you don't want to do that if you're, you know, when you're testing on production or something, or please don't do that if you're testing on production. Um, but then also kind of goes into a few different methods for testing uh, that are somewhat safe. Um, and I won't go through all of them, but effectively it's just looking at common libraries and common fields that are going to be used by those libraries. So like the parameter limit example here is one that you could go for. Um, if you have a parameter being reflected on a page, um, in Express, you can set this parameter limit field in uh, one of the configuration areas. I forget exactly where it sits, but one of those objects like you'd be able to pollute. Um, so you could set your own parameter limit. You set that to like, you know, some high amount more than the application would actually use, like a hundred parameter limit or something. And then you go and you make a request that has a reflected parameter and you make a request with like a hundred and one parameters. And that very last parameter should be the one that gets reflected. And if it doesn't get reflected, you know, like your limit worked and it didn't read anything after that last one or after the hundredth. Uh, and it's a lot of tricks like that. Um, um, especially on the uh, the few here there for manual testing, uh, for automate testing. So he's put out uh, tooling or a burp extension that can do a lot of these tests. Um, 
those take advantage of other things that can be detected, JSON spaces, like increasingly number of spaces that'll be used when it outputs JSON. Um, uh, if you're able to cause an error, the status code, there's a bunch of different things here, just a really good reference resource um, uh, for testing it. Again, it is taking advantage of kind of popular libraries. So if you have some that isn't like built off of Express or using like standard cores library and stuff, you'll have to find some of your own. Uh, but for a lot of applications, this will be sufficient. Uh, and it is at least a good starting place. And he talks a lot about how he tests for things and kind of came up with some, I guess not a lot about how he came up with some of the ideas, but um, he does cover a bit of his process for actually finding them. Uh, so there's a lot of good information out of that that you can kind of apply to your own testing. All right, and then I believe you have one other shout out um, that I quick checked out pretty quickly. It, it actually seems like kind of a cool idea, but I'll let you cover this one. Uh, yeah, we'll wrap up. Um, the last shout out here was uh, Thinkus. Uh, their uh, Think Escapes, and basically what they're doing is they're taking every quarter they put this out. I've been following them for a few quarters now. Um, they'll put out one of these Think Escapes. And it's basically like a summary and overview of uh, good conference presentations within security. Um, generally, not necessarily those that made the most noise or anything that everybody would have seen, but those that they thought were just really good posts, or not posts, uh, presentations at conferences or other research came out. They are very much focused on like conference presentations like... Uh, Black Hat or something, not so much like uh, Usenet security or like the academic conferences. At least that's what I've noticed. They have more of the hacker cons, not the academic conferences. So um, kind of makes a lot bit more practical. But yeah, I want to kind of shout out, they did just put out their 2022 Q4 one. Um, I think it was just last week. So pretty recent. So figured I'd at least call them out as something to kind of follow. All right. So that's all the topics that we have for this week. Uh, thank you, everyone, who tuned in. The VOD will be up on Twitch immediately or on other platforms like YouTube tomorrow. We also have previous podcasts up on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, more links on Anchor. Uh, feel free to join our Discord and follow us on Twitter. Links of those are down below or in the chat. And as always, we'll be back tomorrow with a binary episode. That'll be at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. And we'll see you then.